after about 10 or 11 months, we did get a denial saying that X amount of products already out there have similar properties. Once we went through every one of those, there was probably a couple dozen, we realized there were no related properties to our application. We immediately submitted our application and within a couple of weeks we had our patent. It was amazing. So with literally a year of the time we submitted, we were denied and within a couple of weeks after that, we received our patent. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories Podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast. I am your host, Robert Baer, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to episode 18 of the Invention Stories podcast, Lisa Kreitz and the Shower Shirt Part 2. This is the second part in a two-part series. Lisa Kreitz is a breast cancer survivor who underwent a bilateral mastectomy. Forced to wearing a plastic trash bag while showering, she designed the shower shirt so future surgery patients could shower or bathe more safely. We've got Lisa Kreitz on the line. The shower shirt is a great name in and itself... How did you decide upon the name? I was working, again, I had mentioned I had left broadcast journalism and I was working uh, in media strategy with a very large health system. They had hospitals and, of course, doctors everywhere. And it was interesting. My first line of thought was a shower jacket. Because when we think of jackets, we think of jackets as a protection factor. We go out in the wind, not in Florida, but, you know, most places, wind, snow, rain, you know, a jacket to protect you, raincoat, whatever. And I was talking to the president and CEO of the hospital system at the time, Mr. Miller, who I just have the utmost respect for. And I told him, I said, I'm thinking about calling this a shower jacket. Shower is self-explanatory. You get in the shower with it and a jacket. And he quickly said, no, do not call this a jacket. And I said, why? And he says, because people will be getting in the shower with their raincoats. Don't call it a jacket. And I have to say, I I talked to so many people in the process of, what do you think about this? I became my own research and development department for many reasons, even after prototyping and and giving the shower shirt out. But we ultimately came up on the shirt because I felt what he said about shower jacket. People might get in there in the shower with their raincoats, which were not designed to protect mastectomy patients. But I wanted to make it simple. I wanted to make it as self-explanatory as it could. And we ended up with shower shirt. But like you said, it's a cool name. But the average person, unless you've needed it or known someone who does, they'll walk by my booth at conferences and they'll say, why do you need a shirt in the shower? Again, you want to strangle those people after about the 15th one of the day. But hopefully that answers your question. It was We felt it was pretty self-explanatory. Once they understand it, it's for protection. It's like a huge Band-Aid with elastic. It's The term has worked pretty well. The name works pretty well. I like it. It's it's good. It's (laughs) solid. You know, it's it's easy to spell. How did it come to be? How was the prototype process? How did you know what material and exactly how to make it? Um, To be honest, I just, I used a bit of common sense. I had, uh, and I don't say that sarcastically, it was more, Obviously, we need water resistant material. No question. I knew that the biggest problem was going to be right up here around the neck. Because if you're standing in front of the shower, even if you have minimal pressure, you're going to have water coming towards you. So I thought we've got to use a lot of elastic. I wanted to have something that would not only protect the surgical drain sites, but also support the weight of them. And I also wanted a lot of bathing variety, variety of bathing options. So we ended up with a turtleneck. We have the drawstring, the zip strap, the microfiber on the inside of it to gather any water droplets. Of course, it's got a water resistant zipper and an under and an outer work flap. And I'm going to tell you something funny about a couple of people that tried it before we finalized it. The sleeves come down to the deltoid with the elastic. With this, if you don't need protection under the armpit and your drains are lowered, you can pull the arms way up here. If the drains are way up here, you can pull the torso up. So my whole goal was to protect this whole chest area because the drains, the dialysis, 
it's all usually right up here. So we played around with different things. Like I said, I, I became kind of my own research and development department. I was very blessed to be able to share some prototypes with local surgeons and they gave them to their breast cancer patients and they would give me feedback, which was great. And one of the best feedback was a local girl who I had met. I didn't know her at all, but I had met her and she was a firefighter. She was a local firefighter and her mother had had breast cancer. She was diagnosed and firefighter jackets. Most people have ever seen a fireman or the jackets they have Velcro all the way down the front. They have an under a lap, a zipper and an overlap and all this Velcro. And she came back to me and she said, Lisa, I think it's a great product that you need to take after the firefighter jackets and put one big strip of Velcro. So stuff like that. I loved that kind of feedback from these patients because I had had just spots of Velcro. So yeah, it was truly trial and error with patients. And then I ended up with some infections. I had seven surgeries two infections in one year, uh, seven surgeries, four months of hyperbaric treatments, and two infections. So I was also a prototype tester. Every time I would have surgery, I would test another prototype. And so I think we went through five different prototypes before we finalized. Did you just say you went through seven surgeries for the breast cancer? I did. I had, right after my bilateral mastectomy, I ended up with a couple of infections. They called them hospital-acquired infections kind of a long story, but because of that first infection, they had to go back in and remove a, a tissue expander, and then they had to go back in and <laughs> build it again. And then I got another infection, which was apparently the same as the initial infection. And so, yes, so those infections required me to have seven surgeries, uh, which because of the two hospital acquired infections and four months of hyperbaric treatments for my wounds to heal and for the implants to heal. So yes, it was a, a very difficult year. So all I really did was sleep and work on the shower shirt for that entire year. It was hard. Were you able to go back to work or did you just sort of quit your job and focus 100% on this? No, I did not quit my job. I went on disability. I was on, I guess, it started out as short-term disability for three months after my mastectomy. And then when I started having so many complications, I ended up with long-term disability. So I was out for six months and then I went back part-time because I was still doing hyperbaric treatments. Are you familiar with hyperbaric op oxygen treatment? No, I can't say that I am. It's always been used for wounds that won't heal or scuba divers. When they have the bends, they go down X amount, thousand feet, and it's all to and again, I'm going to sound very ignorant. I should have, before I mentioned hyperbaric oxygen treatments, I should know a bit more about it. But they lasted for four months. And I had to be there at 7 a.m. until 11 a.m. every morning. Hmm. So I would leave there and then I would work half the day. But essentially, hyperbaric oxygen treatments are for people, if they've been ill from the bends, from scuba diving, or if they have wounds that just won't heal. It's used a lot for geriatric patients. Between 5 and 29% of all breast cancer surgery patients get infections. So hyperbaric oxygen treatments are used a lot on breast cancer surgery patients when they get infections and the wounds won't heal properly. So between the hyperbaric treatments and the seven surgeries, I was on six months disability and then I worked part-time for the other six months. Have you patented the shower shirt? Yes, that's, I mentioned earlier, we have a patent and it's, for design and method of use. So what uh, patent attorneys usually say, that's the gold standard of patents. So yes, we're thrilled to have a patent on this product. And how was the patent process? Did you do part of it or all of it yourself? Or did you consult with a patent attorney? I did a lot of it because I didn't want to spend a lot on an attorney. Uh, my husband is also an attorney. He's not an intellectual property or patent attorney, uh, but he helped me with a lot of the verbiage. But in the end, yes, I went through a patent attorney in Washington, D.C. His name is Chris Brody. I highly recommend him for any, any of your viewers that are looking for a patent attorney. Yes, we when we did our initial application, after about 10 or 11 months, we did get a denial saying that X amount of products already out there have similar properties. Once we went through every one of those, there was probably a couple dozen, we realized there were no related properties to our application. 
we immediately submitted our application and within a couple of weeks we had our patent. It was amazing. So with literally a year of the time we submitted, we were denied. And within a couple of weeks after that, we received our patent. So yeah. And of course, I find out later, a lot of people who have phoned me over the years, wanting insight into the patent process, wanting insight into inventing and wanting insight into different things. I didn't realize that nearly 100% of all patents applied for the first time around were denied. Did you know that? I don't know what the actual number is, but it seems pretty common that people get denied on the... Right. And I have to tell you, you know, this was probably six months or so after we had gone on the... No, it was a little longer. It was after we had gotten our patent and I was on the phone with my patent attorney. I don't even know. I was complaining about something. And he says, Lisa, do you realize how lucky you are? He said... We got your patent within a year. Walmart.com picked up your product within six months of it coming on the market. He said, you know, I I deal with people all the time. And he's the one that said nearly 100% of all patent applications are denied the first time around. I didn't know that. And I thought, well, I feel okay now. And that's what he said. He says, you know, unfortunately, he said, I have so many people out there that are still begging for patents 10 and 15 years later. And they've spent so much money. And he says, you know, they don't know when to stop. You don't know when, because you're not supposed to quit. Quitting is easy. You can't quit. So like like I said, I feel fortunate beyond belief that, you know, we got our patent and our company is, we still send out shower shirts almost every day. It's a very niched product, but we're very, very lucky in many ways. And now it's time for a commercial break. You're listening to episode 18 of the Invention Stories podcast, Lisa Kreitz and the Shower Shirt Part 2. More information can be found at her website, www.theshowershirt.com. At the end of each episode, I invite listeners to email us with questions or comments about the show. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about podcasting as well. You can email us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Now, the question we've been asked most often is what kind of microphone should a beginning podcaster use? Now, the one that I've listened to and it seems like most of the top podcasters use is the Heil PR40. It's terrific, and if you're someone who wants to do something and do it right, the Heil PR40 is the microphone for you. If you would like to purchase the Heil PR40, we invite you to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash PR40. Now, we use the Audio-Technica ATR2100 here at the Invention Stories podcast, and it costs less than $80. To purchase the Audio-Technica ATR2100, please visit www inventionstories.com forward slash ATR. I learned uh, that there's there are like 70 mastectomy boutiques. You went to them probably early on, huh? I did. I'm a member of Essentially Women, which is, here we go back to Health and Medical again. It's a uh, VGM. VGM is a big group, and it's where hospitals purchase from them. And their subsidiary is called Essentially Women. And their main focus is to reach out to mastectomy boutiques across the country, hospital-based HMEs, home medical equipment, durable medical equipment, and it's all very post-surgery driven. So yeah, we have about a 70 mastectomy boutiques across the U.S. that have purchased our product. We could have a lot more than that if we had Medicare coverage, but it's not covered by Medicare. It's a self-pay product. So, uh, you know, small boutique owners are a little more weary to purchase products that aren't covered by Medicare. Secondly, we're thrilled to be on walmart.com. I guess we've been on walmart.com since fall 2011. There, of course, the fulfillment group is out in California. We're on Amazon. We were thrilled they called us. Speaking of, you just said mastectomy boutiques. Yes, there are boutiques out there that just target women and breast cancer related. A lot of their theories are they want a one-stop shop. When women are diagnosed with breast cancer, They speak with the local doctors and hospitals, and they want those breast cancer patients to come to the mastectomy boutique because they can say, you're going to need this. You're going to need this. You need to be prepared for this. So mastectomy boutiques do a lot of really good work out there. One thing I just want to say, because you said you weren't familiar with that, there is a huge e-commerce site called CureDiva, C-U-R-E-D-I-V-A, and that's what they primarily focus on as well is mastectomy-related products. And they have offices in Miami, Germany, and Israel. 
so we've been on board with that group since they went online in 2012. If you go to their website, curediva.com, they have amazing stuff. And I recommend anyone that's been diagnosed with breast cancer to check them out because there's things on there you don't know that you need until you need them. And then you're at home <laughs> and you're trying to order stuff online and it's just very difficult. And that's why, you know, I have to say educating is huge. You know, even you doing the show is great. One in eight women are diagnosed every, every year uh, with breast cancer. And as much more education as we can get women out there who are either going through it or might go through it in the future, the better off they'll be. They'll be better off than I was because I knew I really didn't know much about what to expect from it. I'd only seen other people go through it. Well, I imagine you're spending a lot of money and time marketing the, the shower shirt. What do you think has been a good use of your money and what do you think has been a waste of your money? I like your questions because you ask questions that I would ask that a lot of people wouldn't ask. I like your questions. There, there's no question. There have been times that I'm standing in my kitchen so frustrated and I tell my husband, I quit, I quit. And one time he said, you can't quit now, Lisa. You have Walmart and Cure Diva and you have all these people selling your product. We do a lot of drop ships. You know what drop ship is, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Some people are like, huh? Anyway, uh, we do a but lot of But you can explain ship. it for our listeners anyway. That's okay. Cool. Drop ship, basically, like Cure Diva and Unbeatable Sales and Wholesale Point, they promote our product. They market our product on a national, sometimes international platform. They don't buy the inventory. They just send me the orders and we ship them out. It's great because it has built awareness of a very, very niched product that you don't really want to ever need. So we love our drop shipping partners. That's number one. Number two, getting back to your question that I like, there's no question when you start a venture like this, especially a venture when you're going through breast cancer treatment and you're sick and you're in bed and, and sick. <laughs> Sometimes I would look at myself in the mirror. I go, you're crazy. I can hardly take care of myself right now because I've been infected, you know, too many times and in treatment and have so many surgeries that really weakened my immune system. But then I thought, you know what, this is not really about me. This is about future patients, future breast cancer patients that don't have to shower in plastic trash bags. So this project has become my therapeutic <laughs> project. It was my cathartic project to get myself through breast cancer. I still sometimes, six years later, I think I never dealt with breast cancer. The shower shirt became my cathartic project. But there's no question we learn things. You live and learn. The first time we ordered brochures, we ended up spending $2,000 on 500 brochures. Now we get 5,000 brochures for $200. I mean, there has been over time where we've spent money we shouldn't have, but we didn't know any better. We thought this was the going rate. I can say overall from the umbrella standpoint, we've tried different marketing companies. We've tried different social media companies. Some, because my background in journalism and doing, uh, I do media strategy consulting work with several doctors, I know pretty quick if it's going to work for us or it's not. But as a whole, I can't say, I wish we haven't, hadn't done A, B, C, D, E. I always think I'm glad we did A, B, C, D, E, but guess what? I was glad that I was smart enough to get out of A or C or E when I needed to. And I didn't spend too much money on it. There's no question. If you look at our balance sheet, there will probably be things in there you go, oh, well, you spent too much on this. Yeah, but live and learn. We didn't the next time and the next time. I can say that I did an interesting presentation about six months ago at Rollins College in Orlando. Not to make a huge story, but about a year ago, a gentleman who was working on his Ph.D., he wanted to use me as an example for his thesis on social entrepreneurship, being a social entrepreneur. Can't tell you exactly if I knew what it meant at the time. Fast forward a year later, he's a professor at Rollins College in Orlando, very prestigious college, private school. He said, would you come and talk to my students about being a social entrepreneur? And I thought, well, if I'm going to be at a college and talk about social entrepreneur, I need to understand what it is. And it was really interesting. Ultimately, the definition is a social entrepreneur is someone that either creates a service or a product to better mankind, to better this world in some way, or to better the experiences of people. 
And secondarily, use the platform of social media to raise awareness of that service or that product. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. And so he knew it was me. I just didn't know it was me. But after that, going back to the social media, I don't believe for a second, but for social media, we would be where we are today with the shower shirt company. And believe me, we still have a long way to go. But social media is amazing because whether you think of Facebook or any of the other social media platforms, you know, they have their communities, their niched communities. And so we've been able to raise a lot of awareness through those communities, the Coleman, the American Cancer Society, through advertising on Facebook, through we use a company out of Detroit that I really like. We pay minimal monies and we're guaranteed 10,000 views a month. So that's one thing I have to tell you. And and I, I shied away from social media at first. But once I realized what we could do with it, it's really helped our organization. And I will always, unless the table turns and it becomes a bad thing, I will always use social media to raise awareness of the shower shirt, not just for breast cancer patients, but for all chest surgery patients who have drains, ports, or catheters that need protection from shower water, tap water. So which uh, social medias are you on? How can people find you? Well, you can always go to Facebook. It's, of course, facebook.com slash the shower shirt. Our website is the shower shirt.com. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, we are on Twitter. But for anyone that really studies social media, if you look at the upside down Christmas tree, Facebook has 85% of the population still on social media, well above the Twitter, the LinkedIn, the Instagrams and all that. You need to be on, I think, all the platforms, but primarily Facebook for business. I have a personal Facebook page. I don't use it that much. You know, that's for other reasons, but Facebook for business with a shower shirt, facebook.com slash the shower shirt. There's a lot of rules with Facebook, but still it's a great platform when you're looking for a community to get involved with. As I often say, we're not selling hamburgers here. Hamburger, everybody loves hamburgers. Everybody will buy a hamburger. Not everybody's going to buy a shower shirt. It's a very niched product for a very niched need. I could totally see this being something you do till you take your last breath. Gosh, if I'm an inventor and I invented the shower shirt, it's so important. Like, if it helps one person, how can you ever walk away? I thank you for taking your time. Wanted to ask you one last question. What advice would you give somebody who has an idea for an invention? Well, I would have all kinds of advice, but I think initially research, research, research. I mean, that is huge. I knew there wasn't a product out there because I was the patient that needed it. And that's why I had access to a lot of doctors and and interviewed them. Why isn't there a product? You know, so on and so forth. Research, research, research. When I went through treatment, I read this book called Unstoppable by Catherine Kersey, and it talked about it's harder to bring a product to market that's never existed versus a product that exists, and you change it 15 to 20% and remarket it. And she, of course, had different examples. And I quickly realized, oh, my gosh, I'm bringing a product to market that's never existed before. So, number one, I'm in for, you know, a lot of stress, a lot of work. So... Not only did I bring a product that had never existed, then I had to educate about this product. Unless you'd gone through breast cancer or were told by your doctor or surgeon you couldn't shower, why would people need a shirt in in the shower? So that to me is huge. Research, research, research to see what's out there. Make sure you're not stepping on anybody else's intellectual property. And if you think you can do it better, do it better. But you need to have all that information before you start putting money into patent attorneys, before you start building prototypes. I was amazingly lucky. My brother's an architect. He helped me with the visual schematic. My aunt and my cousin helped build the first prototype. They're seamstresses. It was a family affair. And then I was able to get to a friend of mine who was a liaison for manufacturing in other countries. So I was very, very lucky. But a lot of people don't have that luxury. So they find themselves going to these companies that advertise as, we can get your product to market, we can get you a patent, we can do this. And you know what? They may be able to do. But what you need to do is do the research initially and then have an arsenal of real information, factual information, 
and then to take that forward. So I have been called so many times by people, I have a great idea. I'm sure they do. But guess what? Their idea already exists or the patent already exists for their great idea. So research is invaluable for this type of project per se. I want to also comment on something you just said about having passion. Like I said, for me, I was so frustrated. Still a year later, I was still showering in a trash bag because of all my multiple surgeries. I do. I mean, I know the shower shirt better than anybody. I can sell it better than anybody. But the bottom line is this, this product is bigger than me. I can't, in the end, I don't believe I can take it where it needs to go. So I will eventually most likely license it out or try to license it out to a larger company, maybe a mastectomy garment company. There is a business, you know, mastectomy garment companies. And that's what I would eventually like to do. So when you, you laughed, you said, I can see you doing this until your last breath. Eventually, you know, I, I always say that I don't have children, but the shower shirt's my child. I birthed it. It's in second or third grade right now, but it needs to get to junior high. It needs to continue to grow and build and any people, you know, I say this, I think my husband kind of shakes his head when I say this, but I feel eventually, not tomorrow, maybe not five years from now, but eventually the shower shirt will be a household name like a Band-Aid. A Band-Aid is a household name. It's a protective component for a scrape or stitches or whatever. It's a protective component. You use it until you no longer need it and you throw it away. The shower shirt is a protective component for a much larger clinical problem. But that's kind of my goal eventually is that it would become a household name. And like I said, we can license it out and take it where it needs to go. So hopefully I'm not dealing with it on my last breath. You've been listening to episode 18, of the Invention Stories podcast, Lisa Kreitz and the shower shirt part two. I want to thank Lisa for being our guest today. For more information, please visit her website, at www.theshowershirt.com. If you're an inventor who would like to be featured on the Invention Stories podcast, have a suggestion on how we can make this podcast better, or would like to become a sponsor, please contact us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. More information and show notes can be found at our website, www.inventionstories.com. If you would like to purchase the Heil PR40, we invite you to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash PR40. To purchase the Audio Technica ATR2100, please visit www.inventionstories.com forward slash ATR. Thank you very much for listening today and please tell a friend.